My name is Elena Berg, and I am a planner with the Environment and Development Department of the North Central Texas Council of Governments, or NCTCOG. To give a brief overview of who we are, NCTCOG is a voluntary association of local governments. We are one of 24 councils of government in Texas, and our main function is to transcend jurisdictional boundaries to promote sound development and facilitate cooperation among our member governments. As part of our water quality management planning work, we host an annual watershed stakeholder meeting to discuss water quality planning in the region and exchange information and ideas. Our annual watershed stakeholder meeting this year has turned into a webinar due to the public health concerns resulting from the coronavirus. I wish you all health and wellness during this time, and I want to thank you all for your flexibility about the new format of this meeting. I also would like to thank our communications team in the Environment and Development Department for making this webinar happen today. We are still able to have most of the planned agenda items happen in the way we originally planned. That is, we will still take time for questions after each speaker's presentation, but since this meeting is now a webinar, we have to make a change to the roundtable portion of our agenda. Instead of holding a roundtable discussion at the end, I will instead read any comments or announcements you have to the group. You can type in your comments or announcements in the chat box and I will read them. Our first presentation today is from Kate Zielke, Principal Transportation Planner, the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Tell us about the Permitty Responsible Mitigation Database or PRM database and its uses. Thank you, Kate, for presenting today. And Kate, we will now turn over controls to you at this time. Um, hi, everybody. Sorry for our, our strange circumstances um, today. I'm glad you could join us. Um, I'm going to talk about an online tool that NCT Cogs Environment and Development Department and Transportation Department partnered on uh, to promote permitting responsible mitigation. And no pun intended, but in the, the title of my presentation, I use the word streamline. Um, actually, it, it kind of is a pun intended. Um, so let's first give a little bit of background about compensatory mitigation. So this is required mitigation um, for the discharge of dredge or fill material into waters of the U.S. and it's covered under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. Um, in the next slide, we'll have a little more discussion about the 2008 final rule um, that also talks about compensatory mitigation. Um, so this program is administered by the regulatory folks at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. For us, um, most of us on this call, that's probably the Fort Worth District. Um, this is not part of the NPDES program. That's under a different section of the Clean Water Act. So um, in 2008, there was a final rule that talked about different ways that you can mitigate for impact to waters of the U.S., including wetlands and streams uh, and other water bodies. Um, and the preferred method based on this 2008 rule was to simply purchase credits from an existing mitigation bank. Um, and here, uh, what we'll call the permit applicant, so that is the person, say, a developer or Texas Department of Transportation who's constructing a project that impacts waters of the U.S., has a really low risk because they just purchase those credits and then the mitigation bank owner have to maintain the bank and, and make sure they're making progress the way the Corps of Engineers requires. But a problem arises um, when you're creating an impact when the permit applicant is creating an impact in an area that isn't served by a mitigation bank or maybe the bank doesn't have appropriate or enough credit available to mitigate for the impact. So in this case, uh, the permit applicant can uh, talk to the Corps of Engineers and get permission to mitigate their impacts through something called permittee responsible mitigation. Now, there's other cases that permittee responsible mitigation or PRM can be used. 
and CORE has told us that they will sometimes um, allow you to mitigate with PRM instead of mitigation banking credit if the PRM will create a greater ecological benefit. However, as the name implies, the permittee or the permit applicant is responsible for maintaining the site, for doing the work, for maintaining the site, um, and so that shifts the risk to the permit applicant, so that's something to be aware of if, if uh, you wanted to pursue this. It is not um, a development of a little mini mitigation bank because you only mitigate for your own impact. Um, you don't generate excess credits that you could then sell. So a PRM site is not a mitigation bank. There are three parties in addition to the Corps of Engineers that are involved in permitting responsible mitigation. Um, you know, there needs to be a location for this um, mitigation to take place. So this would be uh, a party of a willing landowner who has a wetland or stream or riparian area on their property that needs enhancement or restoration. And that willing landowner uh, is willing to have their property used for that restoration work. They're also, if they are a private property owner, willing to have a conservation easement placed on that part of the property. Now, uh, government property or public property also can be used as a permittee responsible mitigation site. And in this case, instead of a conservation easement, um, the government would have to be willing uh, to develop an integrated natural resource management plan. So the second party is one we've just already talked about a fair bit. This is the permit applicant. They've created an impact and they now have a need for mitigation. And they would be responsible for the restoration work or the enhancement of the stream, wetland, or riparian area. They're also going to be responsible for monitoring that site for at least five years and conduct adaptive management as needed. So for example, we've had a ton of rain lately. Um, and maybe someone had just created a, a mitigation site and it, it washed out all of their riparian vegetation, the core would likely uh, require them to replace that vegetation. And the last party that would be involved in PRM would be a third party land trust. And this is the group that would hold a conservation easement in perpetuity um, if the mitigation was conducted on private property. So this takes me to the PRM database that was launched in December. This database conduct, connects those willing landowners and the permit applicants. It's kind of like match.com for permitting responsible mitigation. So the website requires a login, and once you're on, landowners can enter information about their property that they'd be willing to have um, used for permitting responsible mitigation. And so this could again be the private landowner or it could be a government entity that owns land. Um, and also then the permit applicants can go on. They can enter their mitigation needs and then they can peruse the entries by landowners to see if they can find a good match. Another service that the PRM database provides is an interactive map. And this map allows you to identify areas, let's say you're a permit applicant and and you know you're going to have an impact in Waxahachie. This map allows you to click on Waxahachie and identify what watershed um, in which you could conduct permitting responsible mitigation. And so lastly, this tool um, covers a good chunk of the state of Texas. You can see it in that bright green map to the right there. Um, this area is compatible with the Corps of Engineers Fort Worth District. So some additional features of the PRM database is a glossary, a link to the Corps of Engineers RIPIPS database. So this is their regulatory in lieu fee and bank information tracking system, um, which is super long and, and that's why it needs to be called RIPIPS. Um, but this is where someone would go to see what mitigation banks serve their area um, and what credits are currently available. There's also a link to the Corps pre-application meeting request form. So this is really uh, pertinent to permit applicants who want to conduct PRM. This is the first thing they should do to try and get permission to use PRM. Um, also available on the database is a link to land trust. 
and a link to information about conservation easements. So we are going to give a shot at demonstrating the tool right now. <clears throat> this here is the, the website for the tool. Um, note that you'll have to create a sign-in and you'll have to identify yourself as a property owner or a permit applicant. You can really toggle between those two functions. So, for example, for you know, you may be a government who's building a project and therefore be a permit applicant, but you may also have land available that could be used for mitigation. So, you may play both roles, and you can certainly toggle between both of those roles, no matter what you uh, sign in as. So, first, let me take you to the the home page here. Um, we are very thankful to EMD for doing a great job designing this uh, with us. Um, initially, we provide some background information on PRM. And this is a link we'll come back to. This is what you would click on to set up your login. Let's talk a little bit more. So as I described, this How It Works section talks about the role of the willing landowners and the permit applicants and how the database can help them connect. And if we can scroll down here, whoops, a little too fast, so we'll, we'll start here. Here's that coverage area, again, which is corresponds with the Fort Worth District of the Corps. And here is our, our map discussing areas of applicable use. And essentially that, hey, where can I conduct mitigation? So let's have our impact here in Waxahachie. I'm a permit applicant and I created an impact here. The most desirable place uh, for me to conduct my mitigation would be here in this green shaded watershed. I would have to conduct the least amount of mitigation and therefore the most affordable amount of mitigation if I stayed within this green watershed. If I went to one of the yellow ones, I would create the next most affordable degree of mitigation to compensate for my impact. And then if I went here to one of the red watersheds, I'd have, to, I'd have to work a little bit harder to, to compensate because I'm, again, at a further watershed, perhaps even a neighboring ecosystem instead of the same ecosystem. And so these rules are, are developed by the Corps of Engineers. However, I couldn't go out here in the gray area to Stevensville. That would not be an area of applicable use. It wouldn't be an area where I could conduct mitigation. So let's go ahead and log in. And I'll hope my login is working here. So here you can see that I have logged in as a property owner when I first signed up for this website. So the first thing it takes me to is my listings and properties that I would have added. So if I were in, in fact a, a property owner instead of uh, a possessor of a very small urban lot, um, I could add my property. And I could enter all kinds of information about it. And again, you know, because folks are entering some personal information, that is why we uh, have a login. And when you first log in, you'll actually have to um, approve a disclaimer that we have on the website. Um, so here you can enter a lot of information about your property. And the reason we ask for some of this um, information is it helps the permit applicant identify whether your site is a good site uh, for mitigation for them. View permit applicant list. And so here you can see that we haven't had any permit applicants um, add their impact yet, uh, but this is where they could do that. And again, as we've talked about, uh, you can navigate to some information about permitting responsible mitigation. You can navigate to the glossary, and you can navigate to uh, some additional links. So I think that's about all I have. Um, just map with the different, the yellow, uh, uh, green, yellow, and red options is also uh, available as you say enter the property. You can see what the applicable areas are uh, for that property. Um, but let me go back to my presentation now that we've taken a look at this. And I think my final slide is just my contact information if you have any questions about the database. Um, I'd like to emphasize that 
Um, the only role COG plays in PRM is putting this database out there so, so permit applicants and landowners can connect. We have no role in approving a project. Um, a property that's entered in the database, it doesn't guarantee that the Corps would approve it. Um, so, so we are not a player other than to put um, this database out there for folks to connect. It's really um, the Corps of Engineers uh, Regulatory Division is who could answer your questions about PRM itself. And then if you have technical questions about how the tool is functioning, uh, you can contact END. Uh, so that is all I have for my presentation. So Brian, if you want to hand the controls over to somebody else. Okay, thank you, Kate. And now we will answer any questions you have for Kate. I'm not seeing any questions. And now our second presentation is from Jessica Johnstone, project manager with the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. She will present information about Clean Water Act Section 319 funding for non-point source projects. And Jessica, we will now turn over controls to you at this time. Thank you, Elena. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Johnstone. I am a member of the Nonpoint Source Program team at TCEQ. We fit within the, um, the watershed planning and implementation section, and our offices are in Austin. Our program is totally voluntary. We distribute grant funds with the intention to restore impaired water bodies um, or otherwise protect water bodies. Um, our goals can be stakeholder defined as well as determined by state standards within the integrated report. Um, we are kind of a sister agency to the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board. So the Soil Board works in rural projects, specifically silviculture and agriculture, and we work in urban areas um, on projects that aren't required under other stormwater management plans. Uh, a, bi a big component of our program and a, a big goal for us as we distribute funds are to develop and receive EPA approval for watershed protection plans. Um, for our purposes, the goal is always going to be EPA approved, the BPPs is what we call them. Uh, locally, within the NCT Hog area, General Dallas, Fort Worth area, Lake uh, Levon Lake has a WPP, Lake Granbury has a WPP, Lake Arlington and Village Creek WPP was a project um, ours. And then we're working on developing the Joe Cole Lake currently. Um, as I said, we are um, totally aiming for EPA approval. So we follow this guidance document, the Handbook for Developing Watershed Plans, and the nine elements discussed within that book. To, to develop the WPPs, and we, we follow that guidance pretty rigidly. So currently that's got us 23 accepted in Texas and right now 15 in development. This is our map that the purple areas are WPPs facilitated by TCEQ. The green are soil board projects. These are all approved WPPs. Right. So as far as 319 funding distributed by the NPS program, we we kind of classify into three project types. So you've got development and implementation of WPPs, or WPPs, and then implementation of the non-point source management program. The management program is a document updated every five years. It was last updated in 2017, so we're actually working on that now. If we are funding a project for implementation of the program, it's in an area without watershed protection plans, but we can fund the same types of work generally. So data collection, education programs, uh, BMPs, 
it's really a case by case uh, decision. Uh, additionally, so we'll find a second type that's the development of watershed protection plans. Those follow a pretty standardized project structure each time. Of course, there's variability, but generally, it looks like monitoring and watershed characterization, some modeling, some stakeholder coordination, and then writing of the plan. You'll notice that two plans pictured here, they're labeled differently as restoration and restoration. So generally, watershed protection plans uh, target impaired water bodies listed in the integrated report as repaired or impaired. However, we will also find projects that aim to develop a plan to protect uh, water bodies that are at risk of impairment. We can identify a trend toward impairment to be labeled as a protection plan. So if you have a developed WVP, you're certainly eligible additional funding for the implementation of that project plan. Um, that will look like EMPs, education and outreach, other implementation measures um, identified in the original document, and also may include an update to the plan. This year in our funding cycle, we are trying something new. We have um, selected two regions it's under review currently by our agency. We've selected two regions um, for their a probability of achieving measurable results leading to the listings. Um, we've selected these spaces based on the location of impairments or prior stakeholder engagement in that area, um, successful past projects we've had in that area, and we hope to, to concentrate projects to better meet our goals. This year and all years, um, our grant application will open in the summer. It will stay open for six weeks. Each year, it's about two and a half million Clean Water Act funds. We say 319 funds just uh, generally. Uh, all of our project funds are 60% federal, 40% match. And the, the cost range of projects are pretty variable. Um, match funds, potential matches are listed here. We can certainly get creative about this. It's um, our program is ever evolving and collaborative. It is a goal of ours to build partnerships. A lot of our contractors are uh, repeat customers, so to speak. So state agencies, county, cities, River authorities, some have more experience than others, and we are always inviting new entities to apply. We're here to hold your hand. We're here to guide you through as much as you need it. Right? So the process, I said, opens in early summer. Um, it'll be open for about six weeks. When we open, you'll receive all the necessary information to complete the application with an additional period to ask questions. Um, we'll post, the, we'll announce it on our listserv. I have a link, um, an information link at the end of this to sign up for the listserv. And then once we run through the process, once the application closes and we make our judgments, um, it'll be about a year from the selection process to project so a year to develop the project. All right. um, some some photographic examples on this slide we're looking at on the left a rainwater harvesting cistern as well as educational information um, this is in the geronimo and alligator peaks project again this is um an example of implementation, this is septic system repair and replacement on the left for the Lake Sam Rayburn UPP. Um, another common BMP for us is pet waste stations. And what you see in the left image, and then repairing and enhancement shown in the right. 
Um, education and outreach is, I would say, included in each of our projects. Um, an essential component, let's say, and it, this picture is youth education and outreach, but that's certainly not always the case. Um, training and workshops, publication, PSAs, events, things like this webinar can be expected in any project that we develop. All right. You guys, what we have to offer you guys is, of course, funding, also a network of um, stakeholders, um, experience, um, technical advisement from TCEQ, and then, of course, water quality protection for your watershed. And this is information for you. So it, the second week that NPS at tceq.texas.gov uh, will give you access to our listserv. And then the top link is our general non-point source program website. At this point, I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Okay. Thank you, Jessica. And if you for Jessica, please type them into the chat box and I will read them to her. Um, okay. The first one is, have you funded bioremediation projects? Um, you know, I've been with the program about a year and to my knowledge, we have not. I can't say that that would be out of the question. Certainly every project that we select is reviewed by EPA and up, ultimately up to there decision making. Um, as far as I know, we have not in the past funded bioremediation projects. Okay, thank you. And there's another question that has come in. And it is, what were the priority areas you mentioned? You know, because they're under review by the agency, and the nature of our, our grant cycle, it won't be released until the solicitation is available to the public. And I realize for planning purposes, that's not ideal, but um, for the sake of removing bias and, and keeping a living level playing field, we're gonna release that information to everyone at once. Okay, thank you. What would, what would you consider to be an ideal? An ideal what project? Small project. Oh, I don't know that we have an ideal. Um, and say if you're not interested in developing a WPP and want to work with the non-point source management program um, solely under, you know, without a WPP, maybe education and outreach is a good entry level project to this, but um, I can't say that there's an ideal. We, of course, like to see BMPs. We like to see direct impacts to water quality, measurable impacts. Um, you know, it would just be really difficult for me to say that there is an ideal project. Okay. When we release the solicitation, we outline kind of the scoring mechanisms. And that information is available through the agency. If you're interested, I could outside of this webinar point you to that information. I think that would answer, answer your question more so than I could. Okay, thank you, Jessica, very much for your presentation. And now we will move on to our third and final presentation today, which is from Eric Orsak, Pre-Listing and Restoration Branch Chief with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Arlington Ecological Services Field Office. He will present information on water quality threats to federally listed species in North Texas and ways to support the conservation and recovery of listed species. Eric, we will now turn over controls to you at this time. Great, thank you, Elena. Well, I wanted to start by thanking the North Central Texas Stock for inviting me to talk this morning. I very much appreciate it, even under these unusual circumstances. I'd rather be there face-to-face, -face, but we'll make the best of it. 
I've been with the Fish and Wildlife Service for about 20 years, and most of that time uh, before I got more into the administrative side was spent in a pretty small program known as the Environmental Quality Division, which in the simplest terms is trying to avoid or minimize uh, the impacts of environmental pollution to rare species or threatened and endangered species. And that can take on a whole myriad of, of activities, everything from spill response, like the Deepwater Horizon spill, where you know, birds were oiled. Um, our, what we call our trust resources include not only threatened and endangered species, but migratory birds. So the Fish and Wildlife Service administers a lot of programs. Um, I'm in ecological services, which is just one of four main program areas, and our office uh, conducts a lot of activities. Uh, for example, we have the Partners for Fish and Wildlife Program, which is working with private landowners who want to voluntarily restore or enhance habitat for wildlife on their land. We do a cost share uh, program with them. But today, I'll be uh, sort of delving back into my water quality background and talking about uh, the types of impacts that can occur uh, related to wildlife. So central to everything we do within ecological services is founded on the Endangered Species Act, which most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with. It was enacted in 1973 when Congress passed this legislation and determined that uh, rare species have ecological, educational, historic um, value. And I added the word economic because a lot of recreation is generated uh, worldwide looking at rare species. The distinction between uh, when we classify an animal or a plant as threatened or endangered is really has to do with the timing of the threats. <laughs> so something that's endangered is, is an immediate threat of going extinct, you know, now. And but something that's threatened is, is in jeopardy of extinction at some point in the foreseeable future. So it's a temporal difference there. When you look at uh, what you're seeing is basically a graphic showing the number of listed species, both plants and animals, across North America. There's currently about 1,661 endangered and threatened species, uh, a slight majority uh, higher on the plant side than animals. Texas ranks sixth, um, which is pretty impressive considering we're up against uh, states like Hawaii. So Texas ranks sixth, and that really is a reflection of uh, the diverse ecosystems across our state, um, you know, from the high plains up in the panhandle to the, the piney woods in East Texas down to the coastal marshes. Uh, there's just a wide variety of, of habitats and ecosystems and uh, unique organisms that have evolved. But worth noting, since I'm guessing the audience um, is comprised of folks who work in, in water or wastewater management of some sort, is that over half of the listed and threatened animals in the uh, U.S. are aquatic dependent species. The slide shows uh, a combination of species that are already listed as endangered or threatened in the North Texas area as well as ones we're working on in terms of evaluating the status of their uh, condition. Our agency, as most of you know, can be petitioned when, uh, by, by interest groups or by individuals who conduct research and happen to see what they perceive as dramatic reduction in the abundance of an organism. They can petition our agency to conduct a review. So the, uh, the species listed on the right side of the slide are ones that are either currently under review, which is the UR, or are in Q2 at some point in the future. For instance, the western chicken turtle uh, will be going through a species status review in uh, what we call fiscal year 24, so several years out. But the ones on the left uh, are ones that are already listed and, and would be the focus of a lot of our attention in terms of uh, trying to minimize the impacts of various activities and projects that uh, come across or through our, our office, um, as well as developing recovery plans and trying to 
eventually, hopefully, remove these species off uh, the Endangered Species uh, Act list once they are no longer in need of that protection. The graphic on the right is is not something that was developed in house. It's it's really just to give a sense of the broad array of impacts that can our activities across the landscape that can potentially affect rare species, not just birds. This particular graphic is focused on uh, bird species, but it really applies to just about any type of wildlife. So you have activities like logging and agriculture um, and, and even um, wastewater and water consumption. So threats to endangered species include um, a combination of habitat modification and destruction, and sometimes modification can be um, you know, most of us might think, okay, you, you put in a reservoir on a river, so you've uh, sort of changed the hydrology of what that river, would, uh, the natural flow regime for that ridge, river. But it can also be something um, more subtle, like removal of fire. At one time, you know, across the Great Plains, uh, those ecosystems were managed by, largely by two forces, the grazing of bison and fire, natural fire that would sweep through and uh, keep the understory from, from uh, accumulating and essentially keeping it in grassland form. Uh, as you know, modern man is, is more or less mimicked that with grazing of cattle, but we have suppressed fire, which does play a vital role, um, not just in the plains, but even in the piney woods. Um, historically, would have had a pretty open canopy but when we suppress fire, that, that understory begins to get very thick and fill in, and, and there are ecological, there's sort of a ripple effect in the ecology and, and biodiversity of those areas. So we, when we're restoring areas, we use fire quite a bit, prescribed fire, to restore that native habitat. In addition to habitat modification, um, and obviously environmental pollution is a, a factor, invasive species, most of you have heard of zebra mussels by now, I'm sure. Um, also, a lot of plant species uh, have, have come in as well and, and have caused problems for our freshwater lakes, oleon algae and things like that. Climate change is a big variable and, and a huge unknown moving forward. Um, you know, the, fundamentally speaking, the presence of water or absence of water and temperature are two of the most important factors are variables that affect what organisms occur anywhere. Um, you know, you think of extremes like Antarctica versus the tropics. Those are mainly um, those mainly have to do with the amount of rainfall and uh, seasonal temperatures. And to some extent, world, when you talk about worldwide threats, um, certainly exploitation and overharvest is an issue. An obvious example is um, overfishing of the oceans, and there's also uh, hunting and poaching, uh, illegal trade. Uh, these are there's huge global markets. Um, elephant ivory and, uh, and rhino horn are two of the more notable uh, examples. So when we think about um, <clears throat> sort of the driver for what's happening across the landscape, it really comes down to change in land use. So uh, in terms of habitat, what once would have been uh, bottomland hardwood or wooded, you know, woodland areas, um, grassland uh, is converted to cropland, is com and converted to agriculture at some point, um, residential or commercial development. The most extreme example uh, of, of completely converting uh, what once was natural habitat would be, you know, concrete downtown areas that are mostly impervious color cover. Uh, those activities um, begin a sort of a cascading effect of not only altering the immediate area, but um, also other areas within the watershed that perhaps are downstream or affected by those activities. So you have uh, increased runoff. Um, the velocity of that runoff can be more intense. Uh, those those uh, Stormwater, the stormwater can carry a variety of, of pollutants. It can carry increased sediment loads. Um, 
So as, as you have these changing land uses, you have an increase in stressors, that begins to impact obviously not only the footprint of the immediate area, but areas adjacent and downstream. Organisms respond to those changes by either adapting or in some cases, uh, you know, not surviving. Uh, this is why we, we routinely see organisms that are more generalist, um, you know, like uh, catfish and drum are able to live in areas that more sensitive species cannot persist. So you see this change in, in biodiversity um, from, from these activities. So essentially stream function and health, if you go backwards from right to left on this slide, stream function and health is a reflection of the stressors and the various land uses within the watershed. And those activities, although there are pressures that are similar from one watershed to the next, the magnitude and severity of those impacts does vary by a watershed. Um, some watersheds are heavily impacted by agriculture. You know, hog farming might be big in one area or chicken farms in one area. Um, that's pot pretty common in East Texas, not so much in West Texas. So these activities do, um, based on studies, a variety of studies show that there are impacts somewhere in the neighborhood of 80,000 plus chemical compounds that are registered and in current commerce today. Um, many of those uh, do not have known thresholds in terms of, of what level impacts various organisms. We have a number of legacy contaminants that, um, you know, more widely used during the Industrial Revolution and have just been banned like PCBs. Some are known to be toxic like lead. Um, and have been banned on some, in some aspects of society, uh, for instance, unloaded gas, and there's no longer lead in paint, uh, but lead is still used uh, for ammunition and other, other uh, activities. So we have um, some pollutants that have been phased out, others that, that continue to be utilized in a variety of, of ways. Um, over time, that's created a number of Superfund sites across the nation that are pretty heavily polluted. Uh, we also have a number of what we call natural resource damage assessment cases. This is where the, the most obvious example would be the Exxon Valdez spill or the Deepwater Horizon. So when those hazardous spills occur, there's an injury to what we call trust resources, which is um, can be rare species or migratory birds or, or other plants or animals that we protect. Um, that injury is quantified and we go through this process of, of damage assessment and restoration where the responsible party uh, usually reaches a settlement and, and that settlement funding is used to restore and make the injury whole again so that the American public can have the lasting benefit of whatever was impacted. In a nutshell, the, the, the goal of the program is to, to essentially strike a balance between uh, the needs and services of, of the public with uh, preserving the integrity of, of the habitat and the habitat quality that's necessary uh, for wildlife. A lot of the activities out across the landscape uh, pose a hazard and, and sometimes this is often not visible to the untrained eye. You can have, uh, for instance, one of the activities that we've seen an uptick in, particularly during the 2011 drought, was uh, municipalities were just out of raw water uh, to, to supply drinking water. Uh, the, the reservoirs they relied on were, were getting very low, and so some of them began to turn to groundwater. And in West Texas, as some of you may know, the, the water's brackish and uh, requires treatment before consumption and uh, reverse osmosis is one of the more common ways to do that. The reject water or wastewater stream that comes out of that process um, has a, a number of uh, concentrated uh, contaminants, usually it's high in TDS and, and it's slightly saline, and a common way to dispose of that water is in evaporative ponds. Uh, and the problem is over time, the, the process of ev evaporation uh, essentially concentrates those pollutants even further. So birds that utilize those ponds uh, 
can succumb to a number of either uh, acute or sublethal impacts, particularly if they're, you know, shorebirds, for instance, utilize it for uh, nesting or rearing of young. So we, we have these activities ongoing across the landscape and, and the, the, the impacts to the species vary, um, and that's what we're trying to get out there and, uh, and, and minimize. So we could talk uh, quite a bit about water quality and, and what that, uh, what the impacts look like for a variety of species. I think the best way to do it would be sort of a deep dive just briefly um, into freshwater mussels, which is uh, an organism that we're currently looking at. We have two East Texas mussels, the one's called the Louisiana pig toe, the other is the Texas seal splitter that are currently under review. It's uh, uh, we're conducting a species status assessment. So I'm going to talk just a moment about that, um, sort of drilling down into the details uh, to, as an example of the water quality impacts that can occur for this species. So just as a primer, if you didn't know, North Texas is actually uh, one of the most diverse areas in the world for mussels. We have over uh, 290 species of freshwater mussels. Uh, Texas is particularly rich as well. Uh, we have 52 species. I, I have to use approximate when I'm talking about the numbers because the, uh, people who work in genetics and do the taxonomy um, routinely uh, lump or split species, so the, the exact number does vary uh, as, we, as, as the science improves and our understanding of what occurs uh, where. We have about 11 mussels that are under review in Texas. Um, the Texas horn shell was listed as endangered in 2018, and we have uh, the two we're looking at as well as about six what we, we packaged as the Central Texas mussels uh, that is awaiting decision in headquarters as we speak in terms of whether to, to list those under the Endangered Species Act. Freshwater mussel life history, I, I won't go into too much detail here, but they do have a pretty fascinating life cycle that relies on a fish host. Some mussels have uh, a pretty elaborate, uh, what's called a lure mantle that attracts fish uh, to them during spawning and they, they release the glycidia that attaches typically to the gills but also can, can attach to the fins and other uh, parts of the host fish. The, Glycidia continue to develop as the fish moves around, sometimes for, for days or weeks, and then release in a new area. This is part of the dispersion uh, strategy for the species, uh, hopefully landing in an area where there's suitable habitat and beginning to develop into uh, adult mussels. These are filter feeders, so they do um, provide a benefit for water quality by filtering the water. They are uh, typically sedentary, benthic-dwelling organisms, meaning they're, they're usually stuck in, in the sediment. They're generally long-lived and slow-growing. Uh, the Texas hill splitter is estimated to live between four to 10 years, and the Louisiana pig toe between 20 and 40. Some basic um, like history stuff for Louisiana pig toe is that, uh, you know, they need water quality and quantity that's sufficient to meet their uh, life history needs. That's generally uh, flowing water, or what we would describe as low to moderate stream flows. If you get uh, flows that are too low, of course, um, they cannot persist without uh, being in a wetted area. And if you get flows that are too high, it can, scour the bedrock, you know, scour the substrate down to the bedrock, essentially leaving no habitat for the mussels, and obviously dislodge them and carry them downstream, sometimes to areas where they can no longer survive. So it takes this sort of uh, sweet spot of appropriate flows. Uh, the host fish for Louisiana picto is believed to be, uh, include the red shiner, black tail shiner, and bullhead minnow. Part of our assessment, just to give you a sense of the range of the species, um, at one time Louisiana picto occurred across about 10 river basins in five states. They still persist, uh, albeit on a, a smaller range or within a smaller area, portion of those areas. 
uh, within the five states in seven basins currently. So the map to the right shows the historical distribution in black and what we estimate as the current distri distribution uh, in blue. So threats to this species um, are, are similar to what you would what you would find for most aquatic species. Um, we talked about altered hydrology, so there are a variety of activities, um, you know, reservoirs and impoundments, river crossings where um, the, high, the natural flow regime has been changed and that per, sort of permanently alters uh, the downstream areas. Uh, both in terms of just basic water chemistry, sometimes if the, the flows come off, if it's an underflow dam, uh, the temperatures, you know, because of thermo thermoclines can be much colder than they would be otherwise. Um, there can be changes to suspended solids that fall out in reservoirs. So a number of activities um, change the, the basic hydrology, which impacts the muscles. Uh, sedimentation and flows are affected uh, sometimes flows can be higher, causing uh, the channels to become more incised, uh, sloughing of the, the banks, which can physically bury muscle beds and they suffocate. Um, water pollution, uh, most of you are familiar with the terms, both point and non-point source pollution can affect most aquatic species. So it's not just um, outfalls from industry or municipal wastewater. It can also be uh, just runoff uh, stormwater from, from urban areas. It can be runoff from ag fields or uh, what we call confined animal feeding operations. Uh, these, these can all affect uh, water quality and, and, and cause toxicity for a variety of organisms, including mussels. And we mentioned climate change is sort of um, something that can exacerbate most other threats. Um, one obvious example is if you have rivers that are, uh, you know, most climate models project a hotter, drier climate. So if the rivers uh, have, have less base flow, that's essentially less dilution for whatever uh, pollutants are in the, in the immediate area, particularly for um, outfalls that, that consistently discharge wastewater. So um, there's sort of a, a relationship between water quantity and water quality there that has um, some interesting implications. There's also direct mortality. Um, we even, when we were doing some surveys in Oklahoma, we saw uh, some recreational fishers using mussels as bait. That's not something we had you know, to catch fish, we, it's not something we had thought about before. Um, there's also scientific collection. Uh, sometimes people um, have their own personal collection of rare species. These, these can, types of activities can impact um, species, and we mentioned invasive species earlier. Um, I think we've talked about this enough. I won't delve too much, but reservoirs are primarily built for uh, flood control and raw water supply. There's only one natural lake in Texas that's Cattle Lake. The rest are, have, have been developed uh, through impoundments over the years. Um, the, the important message here is that these impoundments do create a, a permanent barrier. So in terms of uh, muscle migration and dispersion, uh, fish may be able to go downstream, but they certainly uh, typically cannot go upstream. Uh, so these, these are barriers to movement, and, and we talked about some of the changes to basic water chemistry, um, and you typically do see lower aquatic diversity downstream. So I, I wanted to just highlight um, a particular point source pollution. Most of you are aware we, uh, the TCQ issues permits, um, EPA has delegated uh, NPDES permit authority to the state. Uh, the map to the right essentially shows uh, wastewater discharge permits across the range of the East Texas mussels. Um, and, and the point here is that we, we do have a number of outfalls. Um, scientific studies have demonstrated that, you know, although the 
the size of the impact zone varies by outfall. It, it varies by volume of discharge, uh, the amount of base flows in the river or water body that it's being discharged into, and the proximity of those flows to sensitive species. But most studies show uh, when you look at upstream and downstream that there are impacts in terms of uh, biodiversity in terms of changes to water chemistry. And we tried to just demonstrate that um, because a lot of these flows from wastewater municipalities are 24-7 uh, year-round flows, there is sort of a, a, a chronic and persistent uh, impact. And when viewed um, as a whole, it's a pretty significant cumulative impact. Again, not, not picking on wastewater discharge here. I, I don't know how many folks have ever taken a tour of these facilities, but when you, I have, and when you, when you look at what comes in, the quality of the water coming in, which is raw sewage, of course, and then what's coming out, it's a, a pretty amazing technological feat. Um, but it's important to remember these, these wastewater treatment plants were never designed to remove all pollutants. They're not capable of doing that. So, uh, there is a zone of impact, and uh, so we're just trying to raise awareness that, um, you know, the, these impacts are out there on the landscape and do affect, uh, they, they are a part of the equation of uh, threats to the species. So just, just quickly, I wanted to highlight um, there is a category of, of pollutants known uh, by different names. Emer some people call them emerging pollutants. Uh, EPA calls them pharmaceuticals and personal care products. It's essentially a variety of, of um, it can be hormones, naturally occurring homo hormones, synthetic hormones, medications, fragrances, musks, things a lot of us consume and that pass through our bodies and into the wastewater. What you're seeing in this graph is essentially um, the, the lab analysis of the content of wastewater. It's not from Texas, it's actually from when I worked in Nevada. Uh, but you can see a variety of um, these sort of emerging compounds that, although they're present in very low concentrations, um, studies have shown that, you know, it doesn't take a large concentration of, of a synthetic hormone to elicit a response in an organism. Uh, so this particular study was looking at the treatment of wastewater and particularly targeting these emerging compounds uh, by treating with ozonation. And you can see as you went, you go from raw sewage, the concentrations are very high, to secondary effluent, which is typically what comes out of a lot of plants across our nation. Uh, some are removed, some probably go out in sediments or sludge. Um, and then you see three doses of ozonation uh, which was effective at removing many of these constituents, but ozonation is not, um, there is a cost associated with adding that. It's, it's known as a tertiary treatment, um, and, and most plants do not currently have that. But the point of the slide is to show the, the, the complexity of the, of the chemistry of these types of flows. I apologize, there's a lag time in the slide changing here. So um, just quickly, the strategy for the, um, that we tend to employ because we, our office receives over 500 uh, permits of, of different types, everything from solid landfills to, you know, some solid waste to um, the wastewater permits and industrial permits. Um, we have to prioritize what we can look at. Our staff, in, in the Arlington office is about uh, 15 people, um, only one and a half of which um, are involved in, in trying to review these, and this is just one aspect of what we do. So we have very limited resources. Um, our approach is to look at the largest volume dischargers, uh, particularly if it's an industrial discharge, which, which can tend to be a little more uh, toxic at times. Um, that are in uh, areas that are of highest concern to TNA species. When that happens, we work with our, our partners to review the permit, uh, comment to TCQ and EPA, sort of raise the awareness of what the issue is and try to work with 
the project proponent, usually a, a municipality or a city, to on, on ways they can avoid or minimize impacts from that project. Um, avoiding by locating the outfall away from sensitive areas is the best approach. Otherwise, we're left with trying to minimize or manage those impacts on some level and includes a variety of, of uh, common approaches, you know, use of best available technology if necessary, um, and then uh, testing, routine testing with biodaphnia, or, or I should say, um, fetid minnow and seriodaphnia cubia. These organisms, uh, when used in combination and, and testing of effluents, uh, particularly chronic seven-day test, has, has shown to be fairly productive of, of the water body and demonstrate when there is toxicity. But unfortunately, sometimes when you get something that comes through the wastewater treatment plants that's toxic, um, by the time you realize that, that it's occurred, that, that particular slug or whatever caused the toxicity may have already passed through. Uh, so sometimes it's an ongoing issue and sometimes it's sort of episodic. Uh, Almost done, uh, last few slides here. That I wanted to point out a tool we have. This is a, a Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it's called the Information uh, Planning and Consultation website. What it might do for folks that are uh, participating today is if you have a project in a location and you want to just know what sensitive species might be in the area, what listed species might be in the area, you can go in and choose by county. Um, it's a mapping tool. You can draw a polygon around the area, um, and it will pull up a list of uh, migratory birds that might be impacted and, and t and species that are in the area. So I wanted folks to be aware of, of that website. Uh, the other thing, um, this was not developed by our office, but it was funded by the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, it's a, a sort of a climate modeling tool. It, it, utilize existing international climate models uh, to look at historical precipitation, uh, project, projected uh, climate change, and changes to land use uh, to look into the future and try to determine what flows might look like. I won't go into too much detail, but there's a website listed there, and I'll give you an example of what the output looks like. So. The model looked at one of 52 uh, indices of hydrologic alteration. In this case, we're looking at uh, annual minimum seven-day flow. And this is what the model projects it will look like. It was a pretty expansive model covering uh, the entire southeast. <clears throat> you can see um, this is a it took a median value of, of all the um, RCPs, which, which is uh, basically the level of, of greenhouse gases, you know, from low to high, depending on, on what our trajectory is, how much we're able to manage the release of greenhouse gases. So it went from 2.5 up to 8.5, which is sort of the severe. So what you're seeing is an average of that at about the year 2060. Um, the darker red is where you have the, uh, the highest percent reduction compared to what flows are today. And where there's blue, it's an increase. And the reason you're seeing blue, that's an artifact of essentially wastewater return flows being put back into the system. But the take home message here is that, you know, by and large, uh, the model predicts a reduction in flows, and in some cases, you know, we're talking 20, 30 percent or more, which if you're in the water or wastewater management world, could be a useful tool. So I just wanted to make folks aware this, this model is out there and available online. Guiding principles, everything we do, um, we try to uh, base on, on the best available science. Um, the area we try to manage is quite large. For the Arlington office, we cover about 186 counties in North Texas, from the Panhandle all the way to East Texas. Um, there's simply far too much area with too limited staff to try to 
to do that adequately. So we rely heavily on, on partnerships to help um, protect species, and this comes in a variety of shapes and forms, but um, that's uh, critical to uh, meeting our mission in a successful way. And prevention is a, the other thing, you know, the old saying, an ounce of, uh, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, we certainly think that's true when it comes to um, endangered species, and particularly water quality impacts. If we can avoid putting um, uh, uh, areas that are sensitive, avoid putting um, poor water quality or impacting water quality in areas that are highly critical to the recovery of species, uh, that's going to reap a lot of benefits. So that's kind of our approach. And with that, I'll take any questions folks might have. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate your presentation. And now we will answer any questions you have for Eric. Please type your questions into the chat box or the Q&A. Good news, I think I found the chat box, so hopefully I should be able to see all your questions. I can tell you, um, you have a comment here, Eric, that says you can also upload a pre-rendered polygon into IPAC. Good to know for watershed coordinators that may be working in a particular basin or watershed. Yes, thank you for that comment. And we have a question here. It, it is, do you introduce mussel and fish species into waters where indigenous species are no longer present or where some species have diminished in population? And what do you do to reestablish habitats and beds where the mussels can thrive? So the, the first part of the question, um, we, we are just getting into the arena of, uh, the, the short answer is, is we, we the host fish species for the two East Texas mussels are fairly common. So we, we don't believe that's a limiting factor at the moment. We wouldn't be stocking fish for that species, although that may be occurring for other species. Um, captive propagation of mussels themselves is something we're looking at because uh, as the map indicated, they no longer occur in some areas where they, hist uh, they occurred historically. Um, so we are working with our fish hatcheries to collect uh, individuals that are gravid and take them to hatcheries, allow them to uh, release their glycidia in the presence of uh, fish at the hatchery and then we take those individuals back to where they were found um, and try to rear those uh, young mussels up to a point where they can be released back and used uh, for reintroduction to areas that they don't occur. The one thing we have to be careful about is that we, um, you know, that there's, there was a stressor or combination of stressors that um, created the vacuum and, and caused the decline in that particular area. And so we have to be careful not to just put them back into an area um, where those threats have not been minimized or reduced or eliminated to the point where they can successfully uh, reproduce and thrive. Uh, those efforts are, are ongoing. Uh, I, I think we've had some pilot studies where we've put those muscles back out in some cases, primarily for Central Texas muscles. It has not been done for East Texas mussels yet. Okay, thank you. Is water quality improvement the best possible preventative measure for endangered species on a local level? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I think water quality, it, it depends on, on the area you're working in. If you, so yes and no. Water, water quality is certainly an important factor, and for some rare species, it, it perhaps is the biggest impact. Uh, for other, it, others, it might just be a loss of habitat. I think, generally speaking, the more we can try to maintain green spaces, uh, even within urban landscapes, and protect those areas, set, you know, set, set aside areas uh, for wildlife, for, for migratory birds, they, that's as important, if not more, than protecting the water quality. Um, I, I can't really say one's more important than the other. It, it just depends on the species and the location you're talking about. But, but those two 
factors. For instance, in, in Austin, uh, you know, they've, they've got a habitat conservation plan, which is where the, the city essentially works with the Fish and Wildlife Service to enter into an agreement, a partnership that sets aside land. Um, in this case, it was for golden cheek warbler and some, some other rare species. Um, they, the city recognized the value of doing that early on and, and put those protected areas in place uh, before Austin, you know, really took off in terms of growth and development. Um, that would have been impossible to do now, you know, once, once that development is already there. So it's really important for city planners to think about future growth and try to direct it away from sensitive areas and if necessary, and if they've got the budget to do it, protect um, the most sensitive areas. Okay, thank you. These are great questions today. Thank you for your presentation and thank you everyone for your questions. And now, in lieu of a round table, I will read any comments or announcements you have for the group. Please feel free to tap them into the chat box at this time. Okay, uh, will these materials be sent out and where will they be posted? Yes, uh, they will be posted to our website on our water resources page under the green banner titled committees and that's NCTCOG's website, which is www.nctcog.org. But I will also send the link out to the registrants and attendees as soon as possible along with the presentation slides. You can always email me at eberg, E-B-E-R-G, at nctcog.org. If you'd like to receive information and you're not registered, I can do that also. Please feel free to do that. The Trinity River Bioremediation Pilot Project has been notified of funding by the EPA. Would I plan stakeholders please review the plan at www.waterisalive.org and consider partnering. And, and thank you all for joining us and your flexibility today and of this meeting turned webinar, and especially to our speakers, we really appreciate it, um, their willingness to, to do this by webinar. My pleasure.